largely on this idea of constraints and uh, how those get specified in a relational database. So just to recap, uh, the entity relationship model is really just a very nice way of uh, expressing a particular schema, um, uh, a good way of, of looking at the schema when you're, you're sort of designing it. It's a uh, very quick representation. But it also encodes uh, a number of interesting properties, uh, such as relationships between entities, uh, and has these, these notions of, of constraints. Um, now, I'd like to sort of in, enforce this, uh, this uh, general, reinforce this, this general uh, principle that there's no real, not really one uh, right schema for any given scenario. Um, really, uh, the, the precise schema that you need depends on what kind of queries you'll be asking, uh, what kind of data you have available, uh, really all sorts of things. So uh, it's, it's sort of a very broad, uh, designing a schema is, is almost an art. Um, now, I mentioned that there are these, these sort of constraints on the entities and the relationships that uh, get created. Uh, so each entity, first off, has this uh, has what's known as a key attribute. Um, and that's essentially a type of constraint, since no two entities uh, can have the same type of have, can have the same key attribute or attributes. Uh, relationships similarly uh, join pairs of entities. And you can think of the, the entities that they refer to as uh, sort of keys. We'll, we'll uh, refer to those as uh, foreign keys uh, in just a moment. Uh, there are also these notions of participation constraints. Uh, so if an entity uh, a constraint that forces an entity to participate in a relationship. And you see, again, that this is uh, sort of a specific type of uh, foreign key relationship. Um, and also, there are these, these are different types of relationships one to one, uh, many to one, one to one. Uh, that you can also look at these as, as sort of a type of constraint. And of course, there are these, these weak entities that uh, also have to participate in a relationship, and their, their identity is in effect part of that uh, relationship. So okay, uh, that being said, let's uh, get on to the, the, the general theme of today's lecture, which is how do you go from an entity relationship model. Uh, oh, uh, actually, before I go on, are there any questions up, uh, up to this point uh, about what was covered on Monday? Okay. Uh, okay, so if um, you might, uh, Okay, so how do we convert uh, from this entity relationship model uh, into SQL? What are some uh, SQL constructs that allow us to express these various uh, constraints that you see in the entity relationship model? Uh, so first off, um, any entity is in effect going to correspond to a table. Um, this could be fairly obvious. Uh, all of the attributes of the entity are attributes of uh, the relationship. Um, also, mostly obvious, uh, but perhaps slightly less so, is the fact that relationships themselves um, also often correspond uh, to relations. Uh, so in this case, uh, the visited relationship, sorry, relationship set uh, corresponds to the relation, uh, in this case visited, uh, which refers to both uh, some identifier, the key, of the officer's entity set and the uh, key of the planet's entity set. And because uh, relations, uh, relationship sets can have their own attributes, in this case, the attribute uh, also gets brought down into the relation uh, representing that particular relationship. So, any questions thus far? Yes. <coughs> yes, there is. And you'll, uh, well, so this specific relation, no. Um, as we'll see, there's, uh, there are ways of encoding uh, certain types of relations, such as one-to-one, many-to-one, and one-to-one, as um, in a slightly more uh, precise way. But uh, in terms of many-to-one, uh, sorry, many-to-many -many relationships, uh, off the top of my head, so the, the most common way of representing a many-to-many -many relationship is as a separate relation. Um, I have to think about it to answer that question concretely, but off the top of my head, I can't think of a way of representing a many-to-many -many 
any way other than as an independent relation. Does that answer your question? Why do we have the victim? Why are we working You can. Um, sometimes it makes, it makes logical sense uh, to, have, uh, to have them as separate relations, but uh, typically, yeah, you'd, uh, it is very rare that you keep them separate. Um, the one case, so uh, considerably further down the line, uh, we'll be talking about uh, different sort of more complex physical storage mechanisms, uh, specifically column stores. And in this case, every row gets broken down into a, uh, sorry, every relation gets broken down into a separate, uh, separate relation. Essentially, you get one relation for each field in, in the column store basically gives you one, one sort of, uh, uh, it, it stores each field separately. So it's as if each relation were, uh, each field in the relation were its, its own separate relation. Um, and so you end up with essentially a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, each row in these sort of subdivided relations. Uh, because each of them essentially corresponds to one row in, in some merged relation. Uh, but uh, you don't necessarily have to worry about that at the moment. Further down the line. Uh, but does that answer your question? Okay. Any others? Okay. So you guys uh, have. Okay. So um, let's get down to uh, constraints. So when I say constraints, uh, specifically I'm referring to this idea of integrity constraints. Um, there are certain properties that you specify essentially as part of the schema that define what it means for the data to be correct. Uh, they essentially allow you to do a first pass uh, definition of what it means for a, a data value to be nonsensical. Uh, for example, someone, uh, if you represent age as an integer, um, you could hypothetically have a negative age. And well, that doesn't necessarily mean all that much. So you want to have some way of letting the database know that ages should only be uh, positive integers, or, or positive reals. Um, typically, these are relatively simple properties, but we'll, uh, we'll be discussing a couple of, of sort of more complex properties uh, towards the end of the lecture, and we'll get into much more complex ways of uh, for defining properties over relations uh, when we did, uh, discuss a uh, concept called triggers and active databases. And uh, one thing to sort of keep in the back of your minds as we're going through these, cons uh, these constraints is that each of these constraints uh, provides the potential for optimization. Um, there are certain kinds of uh, query plan rewrites that are got valid only if a certain kind of constraint is present. So just uh, try and keep that towards the back of your mind. We'll uh, get back to those specific rewrites uh, later on this week and next week. So, uh, that said, what kind of integrity constraints are there? Uh, well, there are sort of four general kinds that we're going to be talking about today. And this is sort of a, a very specific subset of a uh, broad range of things that you can do. But, uh, loosely speaking, the, the, the four that we're going to be looking at at the moment are what are called domain constraints, which are sort of limitations on what kind of values a field can take. Uh, and A can't be negative, for example. Uh, there are what are called key constraints, which uh, mean that certain, uh, certain attributes, certain fields of a relation uh, have to be unique. So you can't have duplicate values of those particular fields. Uh, there are what are called foreign key constraints, and these, um, these are essentially references from one relation to another, um, essentially the corresponding to, the, to something like a relationship in the ER model. And there are certain properties you get with that. And finally, there are what are called uh, table constraints. And these are sort of a broad catch-all term for um, essentially almost any sort of property that you can think of. And we'll very briefly mention those towards the end of the lecture. Okay, uh, so let's start off with uh, domain constraints. So, as I said, a domain constraint is essentially a strong restriction on the type of, uh, on uh, the, the set of values that a particular attribute or field can take. And there are two general ways of specifying one of these domain constraints. 
Uh, Postgres takes this approach uh, where you essentially define a type. So as a uh, quick show of hands, who's familiar with uh, C, C++'s type def operation? Okay. Essentially, you're, uh, the, this is, this is, for those of you who know what it is, this is that. Uh, for those of you who don't know what this is, what essentially we're doing is we're taking some base type, in this case the real, and we're creating a new type with some restriction over that. So in this case, a rank is a real uh, that falls between 0 and 5. Uh, one other way of specifying these, these domain constraints is to actually place a constraint on the table itself. Uh, and this is the approach uh, that Oracle suggests. Um, so when you define your table, you can add uh, a, essentially one of, uh, one of the, the sort of fields of the table is going to be this, this uh, check statement, which says that, um, in this case, the rank field has to always fall between these two particular values. Uh, everyone on the same page so far? Yes? Yes. OK. Um, one other uh, quick domain constraint. Um, so we've talked briefly about null values. And this is sort of a very hairy subject. But um, you can have a spec. Um, so by default, any field in a relation can have a null value. Or any uh, field in a SQL database can have a null value. But you can um, indicate using this not null um, operator, uh, by, by appending the type with not null, uh, you can sort of say that uh, I, I never want this particular value to have to be null. So yeah, that's uh, sort of a, a very specific type of domain constraint that appears frequently enough that uh, it has a special. Uh, any, any questions? OK. So moving on, um, so we've talked about domain constraints. Now let's uh, talk about these, these key constraints. So a key constraint is a way of uniquely identifying uh, an entity or a, a, a tuple in a relation. Um, so for example, if we want to uh, guarantee that there are no two officers uh, with the same name and the same birthday, uh, and, and off two officers born on on the same date have to have different names. Um, so we can essentially pick a set of these, these, uh, these fields that guarantee that the, uh, that are guaranteed to be unique. So in this case, birthday and name might be one particular uh, combination of fields. On the other hand, um, there's also birthday is, uh, there's a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between birthday and age. So if birthday and name uh, are a key, then name and age also form a key. Uh, so essentially, you can uniquely identify any <coughs> officer, not just by birthday and name, but also by name and age. Um, and in fact, you could also uniquely identify any officer by all three, birthday, name, and age. So. Uh, this is sort of a very fuzzy definition, so let me be a little more precise. Um, a key satisfies two specific properties. First off, uh, you are guaranteed that no two distinct tuples in the relation will have the same uh, value for all of the fields of the key. So two officers could potentially have the same name, two officers could have the same birthday, but no two officers uh, will have both the same name and the same birthday. Uh, the other property is that you can't take a field out of the key and still have it be a key. So birthday, age, and name would not be a, a, a strict key. It's what's known as a, a super key. Uh, but if you remove either name, uh, either birthday or age, you end up with a key. Um, great. So in SQL, you end up defining these uh, using a combination of two different operators. Uh, unique indicate, uh, defines uh, a key. Um, and primary key also defines a key, but it defines uh, sort of the, the most important key. Um, the distinction between primary key and, and unique is that um, the primary key will actually be used 
uh, to decide how the, the relation is stored on disk or stored in memory. Uh, so in this case, if we have, uh, if we're even if we're guaranteed that no two officers have the same name and birth date, if we have an officer identifier that's also guaranteed to be unique, uh, then it usually makes sense to specify that that's, that's sort of the primary key. Um, and then the database, when it builds an index, you'll typically, build, if it automatically chooses to build an index or if it, stores to, it decides to store the data in some sorted order, um, it will end up using the, the officer ID rather than any of the other two. At least not unless you explicitly ask it to, to create an index. Um, everyone follow up to this point? So the, uh, the unique operator, uh, again, defines a key constraint, uh, whereas the primary key operator uh, identifies a key constraint that uh, is essentially going to be used to refer to tuples in this relation. You may also notice that there's this uh, constraint operator. And what that means, so you can take any constraint and you can name it. You can assign it some, uh, some name so that you can refer to it later on. And this is useful for, for two reasons. Uh, so first off, if the, um, if the constraint is violated, if you insert a tuple that uh, duplicates name and birthday, you're going to get, typically going to get an error message that includes the name of the, relate, uh, the, name of the constraint that was violated. So it typically helps with, yes, is there a question? So it typically helps with, um, with debugging your, your, um, your applications. Uh, but it also helps uh, when, when you need to change things around. So if for some reason you ever need to delete that constraint or change it, um, you can use that name to refer to the constraint. So um, any questions up to this point on um, key constraints? Yes. Like unique key, we cannot have a regular key or loop or loop. Um, say that again. Like unique, so unique key is defined over two fields. Oh, a unique key can be defined over both unique key and primary key can be defined over as many fields as you like. Yes. Uh, why? Why is this here? So you can prepend any constraint, unique, primary key anything uh, with this, this sort of tag that says this, this, this constraint is going to be named officer day. And so if I try and insert a second officer with the same name and birthday as one that already exists, um, the database will tell me uh, constraint officer day was violated rather than constraint number 53 was violated, which will hopefully make it a little easier to debug. And if it turns out that I ever do need to act, uh, if I ever need to uh, change that constraint, so if uh, I start getting officers with the same name and a birthday, uh, then I can, um, there's a, I mean, each, each database does this slightly differently, but uh, something to the effect of delete constraint officer day will delete that specific constraint, uh, rather than having to, to go out or update table, delete constraints, Update table officer, delete constraints, officer day. Yes? Uh, can I use the name and age as primary key? Uh, yeah, if you wanted to. Um, but if you do that, we do an index for this table. So you could always build two indices. Um, you could tell the, the database to build a separate index over name and age. Uh, but so at the very least, it will usually store data sorted by the primary key. So but if the primary key has two fields, how uh -huh. we sort the, 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 the So we, uh, we went to um, pretty much in the same way that we discussed uh, when talking about um, uh, so when, when building an index over multiple keys, you can essentially take this uh, this essentially defines sort of a two-dimensional space of indices uh, of so, uh, a, B, uh, so you have you have some way of comparing things along uh, the A dimension. You have some way of comparing things along the B dimension. And you can essentially flatten this out uh, by sort of having one of them take precedence. So, uh, for example, I could say A takes precedence. 
Um, and first I compare the A values. If one A value is bigger than the other, then the corresponding uh, key is bigger. Uh, and if the two A's are equal, then I compare B's. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other? Yes. No. Uh, thank you for uh, reminding me. So, um, a primary key uh, is not allowed to be null. That, uh, that is a very good question. The um, off the top, off the top of my head, I'm not certain. I will look into that and get back to you. It can. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Well, the question is uh, whether, so null is always distinct from null. Null not equal, uh, uh, the constraint null not equals anything, even null, uh, is, is always true. Uh, null is always not equal to null. Um, null is also not, not equal. Uh, no, no values are weird. Um, definitely primary keys are not allowed to be null. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if uniques are not allowed to be null either. Um, yes? Uh, the visited relation. 
Uh, the visited relation needs to be able to refer to both officers and planets. And so what we want to, what we want to do is ensure that um, if we insert a tuple into the visited relation, that we're not referring to some tuple that doesn't exist. Um, if we say that officer number 23 visited planet number 56, there had better be an officer number 23 and a planet uh, 56. Um, otherwise, visit. Um, so the way we do that is by using what are called foreign keys, or foreign key constraints. We specify that in SQL with the foreign key annotation. That's the annotation. Um, using the foreign key annotation, uh, which basically in this case says that the foreign key, uh, that the, the field OID uh, references the primary key of officers, or references one of the, the keys of officers. Um, and just to note, uh, this doesn't have to be one, uh, one field. There could be multiple fields here. If officers has a multi-field primary key. Um, any questions on this? It's uh, fairly straightforward. <coughs> Um, one slight extension to this, um, you can also have, uh, you, you don't necessarily have to have um, a reference to two different tables. So for example, uh, the commands relation um, might reference the same table twice. So for example, subordinate, uh, in this case, references an officer sort of indicate which field is the key there. Um, but commander also references officers. Now there's something specific about this. Typically, uh, the commands relationship is going to be uh, one, is going to be many to one. So uh, a commander is going to have many subordinates, but a subordinate typically only has one commander. So one way of representing this is to actually include the, uh, the foreign key relationship uh, in officers itself. And this goes back to uh, uh, your question about um, do you have to have a separate re relation to encode, um, to encode uh, relationship sets in the error model? Uh, does this clarify? So in this case, each subordinate is guaranteed to have exactly one commander. So you can have a foreign key in the officers table that references itself. In this case, it's since you're guaranteed to only have one commander. Um, now there's sort of a, a weird, uh, weird situation here. So what happens if, uh, when you get to the top of this hierarchy, what happens when you have no, uh, when you have the one officer who doesn't have a commander? Thoughts? Hmm? He could refer, well, he could refer to himself. Um, there's actually one other possibility. No, yes. So you don't, uh, while the primary key itself can be no, uh, you can always reference, uh, the, the reference, the foreign key uh, field can be no. Um, this also allows us to insert, uh, to sort of get around this restriction that, um, so what, what, how do we insert the, the first tuple into the officer's relationship? Um, no, uh, there, are, there are no officers to be referred to, uh, so you can insert the first officer using no. Um, any questions on that? Everyone got it? Yeah. I, I, need, I need this feedback. It's, it makes me, uh, makes me more powerful. Uh, okay, so, uh, yes? So, where did you have? Ah, so there was a con uh, question. You lied. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't say it. Ah, okay. Fine. <laughs> uh, so when you uh, insert null value into the foreign key, yep. so will it not uh, refer an error? Because it is a primary key of that error. Yeah, so if, if you were to insert um, a null into the OID field, that would throw an error. But if you insert a null into commander, that just means that there is no reference, essentially. It's, uh, it's a null pointer. Um, 
for a null, null object at, uh, variable in Java. Yes? Uh, what is the null field which we have inserted? Uh, the commander is uh, a... Could, uh, could you could please? Yeah, what if this table is, uh, the, the field in this table is a foreign key for the different table? I think it's a primary key for the uh, other table. Yeah. Uh, suppose uh, this is null in here. So there's a, a foreign key in officers uh, pointing to some other table, <coughs> let's say ships. Is that your question? No, you have said that we can have null for the foreign key, uh, for, for the foreign key fields. Yeah, so commander could be null. Yeah, what if this is the foreign key for the other table, then this will automatically become the primary key. Right? Um, so typically you wouldn't have a primary key that is also a foreign key. Um, I, I would be very hard pressed to think of a schema where that would be relevant because then typically what you would do is have, um, so are, are you asking what happens if commander is a primary key? Yeah, if, 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 the, if it is a primary key for the, uh, yeah, if it is a primary key for the uh, other table which, which has a foreign key. Uh, could you maybe give me an example because I'm not uh, I'm not sure I follow your what you're asking. Maybe I'll ask okay. Anything else? Yes. Um, 
so um, every time we do an insertion, an update, or a deletion, we have to verify that uh, the constraints are satisfied. Now, for uh, insertions and updates, any insertion can create a duplicate. Any update can create a duplicate. Uh, so we need to verify that the key constraints are satisfied. Uh, an insertion or a uh, update could also create a, uh, a value that is outside of its range. So we need to enforce uh, domain uh, constraints on insertions and updates as well. But deletions, you don't care about either. The data is, the data is getting deleted. Uh, you don't have to do any sort of validation on it. Uh, what you do have to do uh, is enforce foreign key constraints because now you might have uh, dependencies, so you might have references to a, a tuple that has just gotten deleted. Now, how do you how do you enforce that? How do you sort of uh, prevent these references from sticking around? Uh, references to tuples uh, that no longer exist. So, um, essentially, there are, there are three questions we need to we need to ask. So, what happens if we insert a tuple? that references a key that doesn't exist, a foreign key that doesn't exist. Uh, how do we react to an update that changes the, uh, the primary key uh, of a tuple that is being referenced by that primary key? Uh, so in this case, how do we uh, react, for example, to an officer's OID being changed uh, when there are several visited uh, tuples in the visited relation of referencing that? And how do we react to a tuple uh, that is being referenced, uh, being deleted? So, uh, first question, how do we refer, uh, react to a tuple that is being inserted uh, that references something that doesn't exist? Hmm? Uh, can? Or, either can or speak up. Yes? Reject the insert. Reject the insert, yes. Um, okay, that was easy. Um, how do we react to a tuple being deleted? So, for example, what happens if we delete a planet? You saw the uh, Star Trek reboot, for example. Okay, so you could uh, one possible reaction is to delete the uh, the tuple that's referencing it. Uh, what else? <laughs> Yeah, so essentially, uh, you can either, yeah, so there are essentially three options. You can either uh, delete all, rep all tuples that are referencing it. This is known as cascading. Uh, you can disallow the deletion uh, as long as there are any tuples referring to it. Um, or you can uh, replace the, the foreign key uh, with some default value, or possibly null. Um, So what happens when uh, we update a tuple that uh, what happens when we update a tuple uh, that is being referenced? For example, if we update the planet ID of a planet. Great. So we can either well, there's actually a third option. Uh, so we can cascade. Uh, we can either update the ref reference <coughs> tuple to get cascaded. <coughs> Uh, we can disallow the, the update uh, as long as there are anything uh, reject. Or we can uh, actually, as with deletions, replace the, the referencing foreign keys with some default value or, or null. In general, this, this is usually a bad idea though, so while you can do that, I, I discourage you from doing so. So how does this get represented in SQL? Well, um, there is uh, this, you can uh, append uh, actions uh, to this, the, the, the foreign key, uh, the foreign key uh, annotation. Uh, so for example, if in this case, we're saying that if the, the referencing, uh, if, if the, the tuple being referenced by a PID gets deleted, then we're going to cascade. That is to say, we're going to delete the reference. Uh, delete the referencing type. Um, in the case of an update, we're simply going to disallow it. So no action basically means that any update that would modify a tuple being referenced uh, should be uh, disallowed. 
And there's also this option of uh, setting uh, default values or setting to null, which means that if the refer uh, if the, the tuple being referenced gets deleted or updated, you can replace it by uh, you can replace the reference by some default value or not. So any questions on this? Everyone, uh, everyone follows? Good. Some people pay attention. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, now there's one other thing uh, that I sort of briefly want to mention because it kind of fits in here. Um, we'll be talking about transactions a bit more uh, in, in considerably more depth when we get to consistency. Uh, but for now, you can think of a transaction essentially as a batch of, uh, of SQL operations, um, which can include multiple insertions, multiple updates, and multiple deletions. And why is this relevant to us? Uh, because we need to be able to, uh, because one of the, the sort of constraint uh, features is when the, this validation gets performed. Uh, so you can either tell the DBMS to enforce the constraint immediately after uh, an insertion that could uh, potentially affect that constraint. Um, or you could tell it to defer uh, the, the validation of constraints until the end of the transaction. Now this is typically more expensive uh, flat out, uh, but if you're doing uh, some sort of really long, really expensive transaction, uh, such as a batch insert, uh, deferred validation uh, may, usually, may sometimes be more efficient uh, because you can get all of the validation done in one go rather than checking for uniqueness after every single insertion. Um, the, the other benefit to uh, deferred validation is that you can uh, temporarily valid, uh, violate the constraint somewhere in the middle of a transaction. So if, for example, you want to delete uh, one uh, delete a planet and then replace it with another, um, you can do that with a transaction. OK, any, any questions on, on this? Uh, all right, so last thing for today um, is this idea of table constraints. We'll get into this considerably in considerably more depth when we talk about triggers, but just so that you're aware that this exists, um, any table can have a check clause. And inside that check clause is a Boolean expression. A Boolean expression, after every single insertion, after every single deletion, after every single update, that Boolean expression had better be true. And if that Boolean expression is ever not true, then uh, that update, deletion, or insertion gets rejected. So in this case, um, I'm for well. This is not equals. Uh, so I'm I'm not allowing in insertion into this table uh, for any officer uh, that is on the ship with the name Enterprise. There and follow. All right. Uh, one other uh, sort of last extension of that same idea is um, what we call uh, assertions, or multi-table constraints. So what happens if we want to, uh, to establish a constraint uh, that spans multiple tables? Um, for example, we want to ensure that the number of space stations and planets always stays above 100. It's a bit contrived, but let's say we want to keep the planet killers from coming in and destroying. So, um, the, right, so in this case, we're, we have a constraint. We're counting the number of planets. We're counting the number of space stations. And we want to make sure that that number is always over, uh, it's backwards, uh, is always, in this case, under 100. Um, now, defining that constraint as a check constraint on a table is, uh, suffers from a couple of, of drawbacks. And the first is that it's, it's sort of a, a, a bad programming design. Um, this assertion, uh, this, this uh, constraint, applies equally to both planets and space stations. 
and you want to sort of have some way of, of separating it from the tables, having, having the, uh, the constraint live outside of either table. Uh, but there's also a practical implication, which is that uh, check constraints are never violated if the table is empty. So if space stations has, if all of the space stations are gone, then this check constraint is always, is always true, essentially, because there is no, uh, no tuples that uh, it could be violated for. Um, so there is a, a separate feature called an assertion. And the assertion essentially uh, allows you to define a check that is not associated with any specific uh, table. Uh, and essentially the idea is that if every time any of these relations gets modified, this assertion had better be correct, uh, had better be true. And if you've ever used assertions in Java or C or most other programming languages, this is very simple. So um, with that, any, any questions so far? All right, well, that's uh, just about it. So, um, to me next Friday for uh, optimization.